set of books. All right, go ahead. Blackfoot. Blackfoot. Grammar and the Blackfoot Dictionary. But maybe we'll talk a little oh, bit about morning. CBC. Is that okay? Yeah, you can yeah. do what you yeah. want. Well, you're not eating anything. So you can't lose your appetite, right? No. Let Paris and you talk. On the CBC, on what should be called what's the big idea, but they misnomer it. it was, excuse them. This word, misuse of the word misnomer. They misnomer it uh, ideas with Nala I. What's the big idea? So, the big idea last night was what do we do about universities? They're in crisis right now. Yeah. At least uh, in Canada, maybe in the whole of the Western world. And, well, what I said is universities, the whole system needs to change. I think so. Um, every so. Canadian citizen should have access to um, post-secondary lectures, and they should all be online. So, um, what they can do is they can convince all of their um, professors that are paid with the public coin in Canada to put their lectures online. And then um, when people take courses, the um, there are this the fact that the professors have put their lectures online. This frees them up to do actual research and stuff. Because I mean, it's ridiculous when they're having to teach the same thing over and over and over. It's just a waste of their time. Yeah. So, and also, and it's a waste not of public funds, yeah. right? Not so, necessarily waste of their talents, because many aren't good teachers. Many aren't. Yeah. But um, in any case, then uh, the the students, like every citizen, actually, but uh, it, the students who are enrolled, they'll take. Uh, classes and the instructors that they have, there will be more of them, they will be paid less because they'll essentially be tutors and they will be there with open office hours at specific times to help with um, people are the trouble. people that are having trouble with the lectures online. I can't and see there's going to have to be um, lab techs and stuff like that to work. You're going to have to go in to make up the lab component that you couldn't make up at home online. You'd hope uh, people didn't have uh, cyclotrons in their basement. Sure. Time. Yeah. And so, um, so there will be that, you know, people will have to do the lab thing and they'll have to go into um, testing centers to get marked. And I like that. Yeah. It'll be um, double blind. The people who are marking, they have no idea. Yeah. Like it's mostly marked by computer, like it's a computer bank of questions and whatever, and then whoever is marking, they they won't know yeah. who they're, whose test they're marking or anything like that. It takes the corruption potential out of the system. Yeah. Um, because a lot of the time, um, people, you know, they're, they get recommends to go to do a master's or something at certain places. Right, stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and if if the instructors don't want to give them that recommend, mm -hmm. well, I guess they're not going to grad school. No. How, how fair is that, you know? <laughs> oh, it's totally um, unfair. And that's why they love it. Because yeah. the Marxists are going, all right, you know, Marcuse or whatever his name was. I'm going to get Angela Davis a PhD. So uh, the instructors, this all the students it, it can um, computers can keep track of which instructors the students are actually um, watching which lecturer they are learning from and the lecturer who um, they can be compensated so a person if you're a student you can say 
Well, I'm not sure if I understand that. I'm going to try another lecture, and they can try a dozen lectures if they're not sure, you know, and the that lecturer should be compensated somehow. If they're a good lecturer, they should make some something for um, people looking at their stuff. So, and if they're not a good lecturer, well, the system weeds them out that way. If people aren't watching their lectures, then boy, it's a lucky thing we weren't paying them a hundred thousand a year to sit around in a university anymore, right? Yeah, it was a feed up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's that. And um, if you think about it, historically, the times, the people who have made um, major contributions to science or whatever, they have not been a part of the system, necessarily. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, they were really pounded down by the system. Some people oh, lost their lives over it. No. No, scientists uh, tended to not threaten people's lives, but they will threaten people's livelihoods. But I don't know why I'm talking about this. You hmm. should be the one talking about it. Well, a lot of these ideas are yours, right? So. Yeah, they're mine. Yeah. So, um, we will talk uh, first about the program. What's the big idea? Hey, now I. You're doing this on my coin, Pauline's coin, and our Chihuahua's coin. We don't make a lot of money, but we do pay some taxes. Okay, get that straight. Now, when you're doing something on the problems at university and the, uh, the two experts, the two, uh, they're both men, and I'm going, okay, that's interesting, because one guy's got a name like Harvey Weingarten, and I'm going, okay, guy's Jewish, and that's nice. But then the other expert is a fellow from Israel, I presume he's Jewish, and he's representing his wife, they wrote a book and, and resigned. You know, like, get some balance in what you're presenting. Don't have two people that might represent, well, what's the percentage of the populace? Is Jewish in Canada? 1%? 2%? I don't mind you having some representation there, but don't be going, oh, we can't have a white, we, if we've got to have a guy expert, can't be a, a yeah. it can't be a weren't. white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. It just would be Two representation? No, it can't be. You well, know, like, you weren't uh, really bothered by that, though. The mm -mm. Part you were bothered by the women's studies students. I mean, they two of them. Two. Of them there were there. three women. The other okay. three people that were the experts were. There was one adjunct instructor or whatever professor who uh, taught history. And then two grad students, and they were both in women's studies. So you, you're representing the humanities. I don't know where these flunkies, uh, the the guy experts, uh, what their field uh, especially was. They might have said, and I might not have caught it. But you know, have some people from the social sciences, have some people from uh, the sciences. What are you doing? You've got the humanities. I presume women's studies consider humanities and not a social science or something like that. Maybe it's considered a social science. But you know, like what? There's no represent two from women's studies. What's that about? And it, it's because oh man, we gotta we gotta overrepresent people that are marginalized and stuff like that. Man, oh man. That's triggering. I don't find it triggering. I just find it hilarious. <laughs> but there are people out there that get triggered by that. And they're going, wow, that's not representative. There's no way I'm going to vote for any party that supports this kind of stuff. I'm not voting left wing. Ever, ever, ever. It's triggering. And really triggering. It's not like a microaggression is triggering. No. This yeah. is macroaggression, you idiots. Well, what you were bothered by, really, though, mm -hmm. was the fact that um, they're in women's studies, and then um, you said, well, what kind of job are they going to get afterwards, and they want to be university professors, and the one 
um, history. Well, one did. I don't know about the other. Saying, well, what we need to do is pay um, sessionals more because she um, had to sell her books, texts or whatever that she well, had. Well, the, the fancy books, you yeah. know, like, yeah. You know. So that she could pay for rent because she wasn't making enough money teaching one course. And it's like, you're only teaching one course and you didn't think about getting another job? Like, that's ridiculous. You there can't are jobs expect available. to I got no sympathy. live on only one teaching one course. I mean, that's a little ridiculous, don't you think? I mean, nobody can... That's like a student taking only one course and saying, I can't, you know, I'm somehow I'm not graduating in four years so you, because I'm, I'm only taking one course at a time. It's not fair. Now, a professor or adjunct professor, whatever, theoretically, they got to put more time in than the student does, but even so, I mean, nowadays they grumble if they've got a, a professor, if they've got to teach two courses per semester. Mm. I think they should be able to teach two courses a semester, but uh, they shouldn't actually have have to. All this stuff, like you were the one who came up with this idea. It's a wonderful idea. We're getting the great courses, and we talked yeah. a little bit about it before. And some of them are really, really great. Mm. <laughs> they live up to the name. So for undergraduate work, it should just be automatic. What to do? It's with English language, and you try to get the best people doing it. Yeah. But like I said, who determines who the best are? There's an actual vote mm -hmm. by people who are uh, taking the courses. Like, which courses do you want to take? And well, if you go into a testing center, then you don't have to be t tested at the same time. Like, it's, it bothered me when I was going to university, and it's like, okay, I'm taking a night class, and which I'm not a night person, and then somehow I'm having to write an exam at 9 o'clock in the morning for that, t for that uh, that's class, and it's stupid. like, how can that be, you know? Yeah. If, that doesn't make any sense. No. But um, it really, it's they need to put in more testing centers and you can just go in and put in your test whenever, whenever. you want Multiple you know? so choice. there's some people that they they really were I was reading a book recently and um, the one of the characters in the story was saying was waking up at nine in the morning or something looking at the clock and going nine o'clock that's the uh, that's for farmers you know the nine hour and uh, I was uh, just thinking that's ridiculous because so farmers aggressively get up at like four, right it's mm -hmm. not nine mm -hmm. like um, so this person thought that the rest you know everyone in the world except for farmers got up later than nine and it's like wow there's I didn't know that people many people got up later than nine like that's a such a, a yellow attitude I I remember I had a friend um, we're gonna say aggressively propagandist okay? oh yes so I Dave. forgot but I I had a friend and I I adore her um, but uh, she was she didn't realize, I guess, what my schedule was, and all, she was always wanting to hang out in the evening. And um, uh, a lot of my artist friends, that's the schedule they have. They like to be out in the evening doing stuff and whatever. But I'm asleep sometimes by by well, usually by eight o'clock. It could in the be evening. by it six o'clock. Actually, it depends. Yeah. You know, if if I get tired, that's yeah. I go to bed, and then I'll be up at four o'clock doing whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Making some food, cleaning up, whatever. And um, but yeah, I remember her saying, uh, telling me that nobody should have to start work before twelve. And I was thinking, gosh, if I started work at twelve or later. I wouldn't get much done, you know, I'd be exhausted by, you know, t ready for bed in just a few hours. Um, like, I get most we used of to my do work done first thing in the morning. Landscaping in the summer. And, uh, spring too. But in the summertime, you were trying to get the heavy part of your work done. 
by your 9.30 break. Yeah. Start work at 12? What is that person talking about? They've got, they, it sounds as though maybe they were very nice people, but they've never had a real outdoorsy kind of job. No. Yeah, if you're working in the air conditioning inside, then you don't notice. Yeah, yeah but if you're having to do work outside, it's... Anyway. I don't know where I was going with that. It's a point to be made. It doesn't matter where you go. Yeah. Oh, I was talking about how people should be able to write whenever they want. Because, like, for her... It would, she would want to write her test maybe at midnight or two in the morning. You know, yeah. that's that might be when she's feeling most awake and yeah. most. But for me, that would be terrible. You know, it, it would be better if I got to write, um, you know, in the morning sometime. So you get a bank of questions, no even short answer questions, yeah. just multiple choice. But I've actually found, you know, 10 o'clock is a good time to write a test, even for me. In the because, morning? yeah, if, uh, if it's too early, I get, um, I don't know, I get stressed out and I'm, I end up staying up all night and stuff, and, and then I do terrible. I, yeah. But anyway, I don't know if I'll have to worry about that again. So, their final conclusions was the adjunct professor was saying, Pay adjuncts more. No, no, no. I think they were saying hire more adjuncts and then pay them more. Mm -mm. Hire more people. There might be masters people. Pay them less and have them uh, doing tutoring. Yeah. Um, and I mean, a lot of the tutoring and jobs and lab tech jobs that be done by grad students anyway. And. You know, you don't need um, somebody with a PhD to be doing a lot of the stuff that instructors do. They should be doing research stuff. It's a waste of it's a waste of their time. It's a waste yeah. of taxpayer dollars to get them doing teaching yeah. courses. Honestly. So I think the one who was saying hire more adjuncts was saying. Free education. Oh. <laughs> it's costly. Education is costly for society. We gotta get something out of it. And not everyone can, you know, if everyone takes women's studies and everyone wants to be a university instructor teaching women's studies at the end of it all, what's the point? We get nothing. You nothing. Know, like, it doesn't matter if it's women's studies. Hey, you know, like I major in history, but I don't go around pretending that that's going to put bread on people's tables. Come on. It's important to study history so you know how to vote. And I'm not talking about the fake history that you idiots are uh, serving up. Like, uh, like uh, Brian Wilson served up his dad on a plate. His dad was a nasty guy. I'm not going to say what he put on the plate, but he went out of the room for a while and came up with it. I don't want that sort of stuff done with taxpayers' money. So we're going to talk about it more. It was, it was a totally unsatisfactory show. This is going to be a preview of, uh, I'm going through this, Blackfoot Grammar for the seventh time, this edition, the fourth time, and uh, done by the same author, Don Friends. I hope he's still alive. He's figuring out these. Well, you know, when you, when you um, pronounce uh, Blackfoot words from there, it sounds authentic to me, but I don't know, right? It's, it's sounding pretty good now. Wow. Well, I don't know though because I don't know Blackfoot. Well, but no, for me, but you've heard good. people speak. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's getting better. The sound system's are relatively simple. It's not as simple as Crete, but I think there are only thirteen consonants. And then, well, there's several different vowels, but really only three vowels. But uh, you know. 
and lengthen them and stuff like that. But, uh, and then there are a couple of diphthongs, which really are pronounced like vowels in most contexts. So it's, it's like they've got five of them. But this is the Blackfoot grammar. I'm doing a variety of different things with it, so it's not like just reading it or whatever. I'm trying to memorize stuff, but I'm trying to chop words up into sensible pieces because uh, you, know, you get with these languages that they call agglutinative, and the words just get amazingly yeah, long. Yeah. So you can see how long. Yeah. Some of these like. But, uh, like the word for, for, uh, horse. Something like that. Imita means, uh, something like that. That one doesn't sound good. No, I'm, I'm uh, just going, I'm not reading it out here, but Panoka, you can hear Panoka. And that means elk. And, uh, Omita is a uh, uh, variation of imita, like uh, it's a cumulatory vari variation. Imita means dog, so the word for horse is elk dog. Well, in English you'd have elk dash dog, but in Blackfoot the way it's written is like one sort of. Uh, hmm. Okay. So. There we go, see? So you're saying they need Call to have some hyphens in there or Call something? Well, what you do is you put it after the A there. Mm -hmm. And then what I would do with the O is actually do something that shows it's being put in there and then I have an I after it and with a, in brackets to show that it's the, the original form is imita, which means dog, right? But you can see how it's uh, quite long, really, two, three, four, five, six syllables. Well, six syllable words are ridiculous. Or uh, five syllables, uh, really the A-O is, uh, they call it a diphthong, but it's really uh, uh, the, the kind of O that Americans say when they say caught, 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 you know, Canadians say caught, the way they say the A-W and Dawn or, or whatever. It's, uh, uh, it's, uh, we don't make that distinction. So uh, many Americans do that, have that deep O sound. So uh, I'm just looking for ways to divide uh, the words up to make them simpler for people, not just learning, but uh, reading. It's ridiculous. Like when, when, you, when you were reading James Joyce, you found out that words that generally people hyphenize, I, uh, yeah, he hyphenate. was in, doing in that. English. Yeah, he's scrunching them together. Yeah. And you're going, what word is that? And I said, well, it's pretty simple. Just look at it carefully. Yeah. And, but it's not simple when you're reading mm -hmm. it and, and trying to read it uh, yeah. with understanding, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of having to worry over it. The other thing I'm doing is uh, trying to figure out how many words are animate and how many words are inanimate. So gender in Blackfoot, as it is apparently in all of the Algonquin languages, the related languages, the most closely related one uh, to Blackfoot, uh, the gender is, is isn't masculine, feminine. It's animate, inanimate. And I'm figuring that what happened way back when, before these languages uh, split up, that the, what had happened is they had three genders, and the masculine and feminine just merged into uh, anima. So I'm trying to find out how many words are, see, if that's the case, they would have had something like a third, you know, a third masculine, a third feminine, a third uh, neuter. And then what I'd expect is in the words that are native to uh, to Blackfoot or any of the Algonquin languages. Uh, so we're not talking about uh, razors or things like that, right? Or uh, cars. I'd expect there to be twice as many animate 
words as there are in them. So, I'm just uh, kind of checking that out. So far, it's not working out, but what the heck, you know, like, uh, the thing is, you have an idea, and then you got to check it out, and it's not enough to be, yeah, <laughs> man, on this, uh, what's the big idea this program, uh, they were saying at the end, like, what would you, uh, what do you recommend, and one of them did the imagine trick, you know, the imagine there's no heaven, it's easy if you try, that's a song. You don't do that when you're actually looking for real solutions. But she's, imagine if, and I'm going, oh man, oh man, oh man, oh man, no. Anyway, that's about, yeah, a great big no, a Nietzschean no.